What was your recruitment process and training process and things you could speak to um, in, in the CIA? As I was leaving the Air Force, all that was on my mind, I don't know what you were like at 27, but I was a total dipshit at 27. I'm not much better now at 42, but. Yeah, you and me both. <laughs> But I was, until you make it. Yeah, but I was like, I just wanted to be anything other than a military officer. So I was actually in the process of applying to the Peace Corps through this thing called the internet, which was still fairly rudimentary in 2007. Uh, I had a computer lab that we went to and it had 10 computers in it. You had to log in and log out and slow internet and everything else. But anyways, I was filling out an online application to go work uh, in the US Peace Corps. I wanted to grow my hair out. I wanted to stop wearing shoes that were shiny. I wanted to meet a hippie chick and have hippie babies in the wild teaching Nigerian children how to read. So that was the path I was going down. And as I filled in all of my details, there came this page that popped up and it was this blinking red page and it said, stop here. You may qualify for other government positions. If you're willing to put your application on hold for 72 hours, that gives us a chance to reach out to you. So again, 27-year-old dipshit, I was like, sure, I'll put myself on hold if I might qualify for other government opportunities. And then about a day later, I got a phone call from an, un, an, an almost unlisted number. It just said 703, mm -hmm. uh, which was very strange to see on my flip phone at the time, just one 703 area code. Uh, and I picked it up and, and it, was, it was a person from Northern Virginia asking me if I would be telling me that I was qualified for a position in national security. And if I would be interested, they'll pay for my ticket and fly me up to, to Langley, Virginia. They didn't say CIA. They said Langley. I put one and one together and I was like, maybe this is CIA. Yeah. Like this could, how cool is this? Yeah, yeah. Or maybe this is all make-believe and this is totally fake. So either way, it doesn't hurt me at all to say yes. They already have my phone number. So yes, yes, yes. And then I, I remember thinking, there's no way that happened and this isn't real. And then a day later, I got a FedEx or a, an overnight delivery of an airplane ticket and a hotel reservation and a rental car reservation. And then I just kept doing the next thing, which I found out later on is a form of control. You just do the next thing that they tell you to do. And then before I knew it, I was interviewing in a nondescript building with a, with a person who only told me their first name uh, for a position with the National Clandestine Service. So you never really got a chance to think about it because there's a small steps along the way and it kind of just leads you uh, and your, maybe your personality is such that. That's an adventure. It's an adventure and it, you don't, because it's one step at a time, you don't necessarily see the negative consequences of the adventure. You don't think about any of that. You're just stepping on, stepping into the adventure. And it's easy. There's no work involved. Somebody else is doing all the work, telling me where to be and when. It's a lot like basic training in the military. Anybody who's ever been through basic training will tell you they hated the first few days. And then by the end, it was really comforting because. You just did what you were told. They told you when to eat. They made the decision of what to eat. And then you just, you marched when they told you to march, shined your shoes when they told you to shine your shoes. Human beings love being told what to do. What about the training process um, for, for, for beco uh, becoming a covert CIA agent? Yeah, so, uh, so the interview process is yeah the interview process too this was that how rigorous was that it was a, it was very rigorous that was where it became difficult everything up to the first interview was easy but there's three interviews uh, and some people are lucky enough to have four or five interviews if something goes wrong or something goes awry with the first few interviews uh, and again this might be dated from when i went through but uh but during the interview process is when they start they do your psychological evaluations they do your uh, they do um, personality assessments. They do skills assessments. They'll start sending you back to your wherever you're living with assignments, not not Intel assignments, but actual like homework assignments. Mm -hmm. Write an essay about three parts of the world that you think will be most impacted in the next three to five years, or you know, prioritize the top three strategic priorities for the United States and you know, put it into 250 words or 2,500 words and whatever else, double spaced in this font, yada, 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 like super specific stuff. It's kind of stressful, uh, but it's just like going back to college again. So you go through all of those acts and then you submit this stuff to some PO box that doesn't have anybody's ever going to respond to you. And then you hope you just send it into the ether 
and you hope that you hope that you sent it right. You hope that you wrote right, well enough. You hope that your assessment was right, whatever else it might be. And then eventually you get another phone call that says, hey, we received your package. You've been moved to the next level of uh, interview. And now we need you to go to this other nondescript building in this other nondescript city. And then you start meeting, you start uh you start uh, sitting in waiting rooms with other groups of people who are at the same phase of interview with you, which were some of the coolest experiences that I remember still. One of my best friends to this day, who I don't get to talk to because he's still undercover, is a guy I met during those interview processes. And I was like, oh, we met. I saw what he was wearing. He saw what I was wearing. I was so brown. you immediately connected and you liked the people there. Close. More like we immediately judge each other because we're all untrained. Right. So he looked at me and he was like, brown dude with crazy hair and i was wearing dude i was dressed like a total ass i was dressed in like a a clubbing shirt yeah i don't know why i thought it'd be a good idea to go to a cia interview in like a clubbing shirt with my buttons unbuttoned down to here yeah um and he was like yeah you were really after we got in he was like yeah dude you were always really cool to talk to but i was like there's no way that idiot's getting in and i remember looking at him being like dude you were just another white guy in a black suit yeah they're not looking for you yeah. but here you are yeah. So it was just those kinds of things were so interesting because we were totally wrong about what CIA was looking for. Until you're in, you have no idea what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, and you're just, a, you're just shooting in the dark. Did they have you do a, like a lie detector test? Yes, it's called a polygraph. Polygraph. How effective, just interesting for our, our previous discussion, how effective are those? Polygraphs are really interesting. So one of the things that people don't understand about polygraphs is that polygraphs aren't meant to detect a lie. Like they're called a lie detector, yeah. but they're not actually meant to detect a lie. They're built to detect variants from your physiological baseline. Mm. So they're essentially meant to identify uh, sensitivities to certain types of questions. And then as they identify a sensitivity to a question, it gives the interviewer an additional piece of information to direct the next round of questions. So then from there, they can kind of see how sensitive you are to a certain level of questions. And your sensitivity could be a sign of dishonesty, but it could also be a sign of vulnerability. So the interrogator themselves, the interviewer themselves, they're the one that have to make the, the judgment call as to which one it is, which is why you might see multiple in, uh, interviewers over the course of multiple polygraphs. Uh, but that's really what they're all about. So, I mean, outside of, they're extremely uncomfortable, like they're mentally uncomfortable, but then there's also, you've got to, you sit on a pad because the pad is supposed to be able to tell like your body movements, but also like your sphincter mm -hmm. uh, contractions or whatever. So you're sitting on this pad, you're plugged in, you're strapped in, you're tied up and it takes so much time to get in there. And then they start asking you questions, baseline questions at first, and then other questions from there. And you're just answering the best you can and you never know what they're seeing and you don't know what they're doing. And it's really hard not to get anxious of that anyways. And Are they it, the whole time monitoring the the readings? Yeah, from like a big, they've got multiple screens and they've got just, it's all information superiority. They have information superiority. You're the idiot looking away from them or looking sideways of them mm -hmm. and trying not to move because you're afraid that if you like have gas or if you move a little bit, it's going to yeah. vary you from your baseline. Yeah. And the whole time you're worried, your heart's racing and your blood pressure's increasing, which is a variance from baseline. Yeah. So yeah, that, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting art. Or your baseline. Correct. Maybe there's some people that are just chilling the whole time <laughs> and that's their baseline. <laughs> right, right. But, so, but that's what they're doing. They're establishing a baseline. I mean, I guess that means the polygraph is a, is a, is a skill that you develop to do, to do it well. So when people talk about beating a lie detector, it's not that they're telling an effective lie. That's not hard. It's not hard to tell a lie to an interviewer. What And the interviewer doesn't care if you're being honest or not honest about a topic. What they're looking for is sensitivity. If they see no sensitivity, that's a big sign for them. That's a big sign that you're probably a pathological liar. If you show sensitivity to many things, then that's a sign that you're probably an anxious person. And they can still reset their baseline because they can tell how your anxiety is increasing, you know, in 15 minute increments. It's, it's a unique skill. I mean, a really good polygrapher is, a, is immensely valuable. But the, uh, yeah, it's the misnomers, the misconceptions about polygraphs are vast. You also mentioned personality tests. That's really interesting. So how, how effective are personality tests? One for the hiring process, but also for understanding a human being. So personality is extremely important for understanding a human being. And I would say that there's a thousand different ways of looking at personality. The only one that I count with any, with any significance is the MBTI. And the MBTI is what all the leading spy agencies around the world use as well. 
Well, that's all kind of interesting to hear. Oh, yeah. So there's been criticisms of that kind of test. There have been criticisms for a long time. Yeah, and you you think there's value? Absolutely, absolutely. And here's there's a few reasons why, right? So first, MBTI makes the claim that your core personality doesn't change over time, uh, and that's how it's that's how it's calibrated. And one of the big arguments is that people say that your personality can change over time. Now, uh, what I in my experience, the MBTI is exactly correct. You can your core personality does not change. Because your core personality is de is defined as your personality when all resources are removed. Mm -hmm. So essentially, your emergency mode, your dire conditions, that is your core personality. We can all act a little more extroverted. We can all, you know, be a little more empathetic when we have tons of time and money and patience. When you strip away all that time, money, and patience, how empathetic are you? How how much do you like being around other people? How much do you like being alone? Do you make judgments or do you do you analyze information? Uh, that's what's so powerful about MBTI is it, it's talking about what people are like when you strip away resources. And then because it's so consistent, it's also only four codes. It's super easy to be able to assess a human being through a dialogue, through a series of conversations, to be able to hone in with high accuracy what is their four code four letter code. There's only 16 options and it becomes extremely valuable. Is it perfectly precise? And does everybody do it the same? I mean, those things are, the answers to those are no, but is it operationally useful in a short period of time? That is a resoundingly powerful yes. Yeah, I just, I, I only know, I think the first letter is introverted and extroverted, right? Yep. Uh, I, I, I've, I've taken the test before, just a, like a crude version of the test, and that's the, the same problem you have with IQ tests. Yeah. There's the right, uh, thorough way of doing it, and right. then there's like fun internet way. Of doing it. <laughs> and um, do, I, do you mind sharing what your uh, personality? Yeah. Um, my my type index. Yes, I'm an ENTP. That's an extrovert, intuitor, perceiver, uh, uh, thinker. Mm -hmm. ENT thinker, P perceiver. My wife is an ISFJ, which is the polar opposite of me. E, I'm extroverted, she's introverted. I'm an intuitor, she's a sensor. Uh, uh, I'm a thinker, she's a feeler. I'm a perceiver, she's a judger. Is there good science on like uh, long-term successful relationships in terms of the dynamics of that, the 16? I wonder if there's good data on this. I don't, I don't think there's a lot of good data in personalities writ large. Yeah because there's not a lot of money to be made in personality testing. But I would say that there's, uh, that with, with experience, with a good MBTI test, with a good paid test, a 400, 500 question test, once you understand your own code, and then you're, you're taught how to assess the code of others, with those two things kind of combined, because then you have experience and learning, uh, it's, it becomes very useful and you can have high confidence in this in the conclusions that you reach about people's professions, about uh, people's relationships with family, about people's relationships professionally, people's capabilities to deal with stress, uh, how people will perform uh, when pushed outside of their comfort zones. Really, really powerful, useful stuff in corporate world and in the espionage world. So in terms of compressed representation of another human being, um you can't do much better than those four letters. I don't believe you can do much better. In my experience, I have not seen anything better. Yeah, it's, it is kind of, it's uh, difficult to realize that there is a core personality or the degree that's true, it seems to be true. It's even more difficult to realize that there is a stable, or at least the science says so, a stable, consistent intelligence, unfortunately. Uh, you know, the G factor that they call. That uh, if you do a barrage of IQ tests, that's going to um, consistently represent that G factor. And we're all born with that and we can't fix it. Yeah. And that defines so much of who we are. It's sad. I don't see it as sad because it's, for me, the faster you learn it, the faster you learn what your own sort of natural strengths and weaknesses are, the faster you get to stop wasting time Yeah on things that you're never gonna be good at, and you get to double down on the things that you're already naturally skilled or interested in. So there is a, there's always a silver lining to a cloud. <laughs> but I know now that I will never be a ballerina or a ballerino 
I know that I'll never be an artist. I'll never be a musician. I'll never be any of those things. Mm -hmm. And when I was 18, that might've made me sad. But now at 42, I'm like, well, shit, awesome. I can go be something else good Why instead of think always being bad. You're not gonna be a ballerina. Uh, we know. Because I'm not graceful. And you, you've 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 learned this I've through learned. years of experience. Yeah, okay. exactly. Well, I don't know if there's an MBTI equivalent for the for grace of movement. I think it's called S sensor. Oh, okay. yeah, because oh. A, a sensor is someone who's able to interact with the world around them through their five senses very effectively. Mm -hmm. Like if you talk to dancers, dancers can actually feel the grace in yeah. all of their muscles. They know what position their finger is in. I don't have any idea. I don't know what position my feet are in right now. I'd have to look to make sure I actually that's feel really the floor right. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely have. Oh, that's good to know. So I don't, you know, I'm not a dancer, but I do have that. I You're have a musician, a, man. Like, well, the music, I don't to know. To be if able that's to plug a guitar? Sure. Yeah, that's true. That, that there is that physical component. But I think deeper, because there's a technical aspect to that mm. that's just like, um, it's less about feel, but I do know jujitsu, you know, and grappling, I've done all my life. I don't, you know, there's some people who are clumsy and they drop stuff all the time. They run into stuff. I don't, I don't, first of all, I don't know how that happens, but to me, <laughs> I just have an awareness of stuff. Like if there's like a little- Spatial orientation. Yeah, like I, I, like I know that there's a small object I have to step over and I have a good sense of that. It's so, it's so interesting. Yeah, you're just like born with that or something. My wife is brilliant and she still walks into doors. Yeah. I mean, she'll walk in a doorway, she'll bang her knee on the same wall that's been there for the last 50 it's, years. It's, it's uh, for some reason, really hilarious. So it's good for her. <laughs>